So I'm going to use the example of the allosteric mal 20 inhibitors, which is a project that we used uh, a couple of that we worked on a couple of years ago at Novartis. And just starting with a few words on the target, MALT1 is an essential protein in the uh, NF-kappa-B pathway, which is important because it regulates uh, quite a few immune functions, in particular in, in lymphocytes. And the pharma industry has been interested in this pathway for a while, but it turned out to be very difficult to, um, to target because if you shut down NF-kappa-B, you will get very strong immunosuppression and uh, toxicities. Now, MALT1 is a bit special because it has two different functions as seen on this uh, picture here in gray. The first function is one that directly regulates NF-kappa-B through a scaffold-dependent effect. And of course, if you shut that down, you would get the immunosuppression that I was mentioning. We were interested in the other function of MALT1, which is in green here. Uh, that is a protease-dependent function that cleaves several negative regulators of NF-kappa-B. So the hypothesis was if we could specifically target the protease function, we would release these negative regulators and just decrease the activation, but not shut it down completely. So hopefully we could have an impact in certain autoimmune diseases, which are driven by this pathway, but not the toxicities that I was mentioning. So this was our hypothesis. We're also interested in MALT1 in the context of cancer, uh, because they are in um, a subset of lymphomas uh, activating mutations upstream of MALT1, which lead to constitutive activation of the protease. So the hypothesis was if we could inhibit the protease activity, we could actually treat these lymphoma subsets. So now we come to the uh, drug discovery story. And when we started, uh, there was one compound described as a MALT1 inhibitor, is shown here. It was built as a classical cysteine protease inhibitor. MALT1 is a cysteine protease by taking uh, four amino acids of uh, the sequence of MALT1 and adding this electrophilic warhead, this fluorometal ketone here, uh, to trap the catalytic cysteine. Now, when you look at this compound, uh, you know, it, it's very potent, three nanomolar and the biochemical assay, but it's not really a good starting point for drug discovery. It's very polar, peptidic. Uh, you, don't, you don't even have any activity in cells because of the very low permeability. And it's not very selective against uh, other proteases. So clearly, we thought that's not going to work for us to make a neural uh, MALT1 inhibitor. So we decided to run an HGS rather than optimizing the scaffold. And one of the hits that we found is shown here. And you immediately see that it looks quite different. And uh, one of the things that intrigued us at the beginning was that it didn't contain any obvious electrophilic warhead. And there are some cysteine protease inhibitors that are not covalent, but many of them are. So we were asking ourselves, you know, how does it actually inhibit uh, the protease? And I'll come back to that at the end of the talk, because it actually took us quite some time to, to find out. Nonetheless, it was interesting. It was 300 nanomolar. It was validating in a lot of... Um, by a physical assay, so we decided to work on this. And when you have a hit like that, that is a racemate, uh, the first thing you need to do is uh, to separate the two enantiomers, and the data is really textbook um, uh, medicinal chemistry. When you separate the racemate, you have one enantiomer, which is twofold more potent in the biochemical assay, so that's compound two, already showing activity in cells, while the other enantiomer, compound three, is completely inactive. So that's really uh, an additional uh, piece of data that suggests that we have a specific inhibitor. Okay, and then the first thing that uh, we thought out to do was to understand the pharmacophore. So Anita already talked about this. It's essential that we spend the time to understand what in our molecule is contributing to binding. So here we started with the chromane and we first removed this aromatic ring Unfortunately, when we remove the aromatic ring, uh, we lose the potency. So that suggests that it's needed. The other feature in the chromane is the oxygen. We were asking ourselves, is that a potential hydrogen bond acceptor? So we removed it, and that's compound five. When you replace it with a carbon, you lose all the potency. And on the right, when you change the oxygen to a sulfur, you also lose a little bit of potency, and sulfur is a little bit less of a good hydrogen bond acceptor. So that was sort of going in the right direction that this oxygen was important and that it was a hydrogen bond acceptor. 
So now we know a little bit more about the chromane. We can go into looking at the substitution of this aromatic ring. And it turned out that only the sixth position could be uh, substituted. And what we needed was small uh, lipophilic groups, such as bromine, fluorine. These were the best. When you went to polar groups, that had, that's at the bottom. Uh, so hydroxyls, uh, amines, or carboxylic acids, we really lost uh, most of the points. OK, so now we uh, know a little bit more about our chromane, uh, and we turn to uh, this central urea, uh, which is basically at the core of the molecule. And uh, of course, we wanted to understand the contribution of this urea also because ureas are, are not very attractive in terms of fiscal properties. I'll come back to that a little bit later. So first, we replaced each nitrogen with a carbon. And we saw that when we replaced the nitrogen on the right side of the molecule, we lost all the potency. While um, when we replace the nitrogen on the left, we retain some of the potency. So the one on the right seems to be more important. However, when we methylate either, so that's compound 11 and 12 at the bottom, we lost all of the potency. So what we, what we find out is that the urea is indeed important. We're not sure whether it's a direct binding or a conformational effect, but we decided actually to keep it uh, for uh, the early optimization. OK, the last piece of the molecule that we haven't looked at so far is the right part, so the aniline. And there we used uh, a tactic that is uh, very useful, which is to develop high-throughput synthetic methodology to quickly explore uh, the ACR. So uh, we, we used a, uh, a reaction that is here at the top, where we make uh, a carbonate, an activated carbonate, that we can uh, very quickly react with uh, a wide variety of amines. And with that, we could produce about 50 analogs very quickly and determine the ACR. So what we know from this study is that we need an aromatic group, but that we can have a heterocycle like this pyridine in uh, compound 15 at the bottom. So that's good for properties. We know that we need a lipophilic group in the three position. Uh, the better ones are chlorine or a CF3. And we know um, that we can put many substituents in the four position, for example, uh, this triazole in compound 16, which brings a little bit more potency and is also helpful to bring a bit of polarity. Okay, so now we had a pretty potent compound, um, but we were stuck. Actually, we could improve our biochemical potency to 30 nanomolar, but our cellular potency was plateauing. So we asked ourselves, okay, which exit vector have we not yet explored? And if, if you followed the... Uh, um, the, the few slides before, you realize that these two um, we had not yet probed, and for obvious reasons, because of synthetic accessibility. And we decided, actually, that in order to quickly explore that, we needed to change scaffold. Right? So we changed the chromane scaffold from, uh, to a quinoline, because the quinoline is a good uh, bioisoster. Right? It's flat as the chromane, and it contains this hydrogen bond acceptor, the nitrogen, to replace the oxygen, right? And of course, as a chemist, you quickly see that the quinoline may be easier to uh, substitute. And for example, just by making this chlorine version, so compound 17 here on the slide, we got uh, a boost in potency. And this was a great starting point to do another library, high throughput synthesis, uh, by adding uh, smaller means. And you see that with this, we got compound 18, which was a five nanomolar compound with uh, extremely uh, improved cellular potency. And this was actually the first great in vitro tool compound to explore the biology. So this was good. However, um, you may probably already tell that this is far from being a lead. And the reason for this is that this compound, when we put it into uh, a rodent PK, we were actually not surprised to see that the oral bioavailability was very low. And uh, the obvious reason for this low oral bioavailability was a, an extremely low solubility uh, below uh, 2 micrograms per ml, which is not surprising for uh, a bis uh, aromatic urea. So how do we solve that? That's really the next thing that we want to solve to turn this into uh, a lead. Now, to know uh, what to do, actually, we, uh, we decided to look at a, a broader set of data uh, and what struck us is that the melting point of this compound was, was quite high. The lipophilicity is also high around four, but the melting point was very high. And as, as Rob told you, this is a typical brick dust 
uh, compound um, with very high crystal lattice energy. And so what we did there was, uh, what is typically useful is to get a small molecule X-ray. Um, and this revealed that the high crystal packing energy was due to several things. First, we have a very planar molecule. So we have stacking between several molecules. Then we have intermolecular water mediated H bonds with the urea, with the central urea. And a little more surprising, we had this um, non-classical intermolecular uh, H bonds between the nitrile and the polarized C5 aromatic hydrogen of the quinine. So now we have an X-ray, so we can start designing compounds that hopefully we ha will have uh, a lower melting point. And actually, we tried very hard to do that on this scaffold, but we couldn't. And very quickly, we realized the only way to, to get out of this low solubility was to do another step of scaffold morphing. And this is shown here. So we had to go from the 6-6 quinoline system to this 5-6 parazolopyrimidine system. And you see that the potency of compound 19 here is retained, more or less. But now we start to see measurable solubility. And you can explain this by just looking at the melting point here at the bottom, which is reduced, while the lipophilicity is the same. And when you overlay the X-ray structures that's at the bottom of the slide, you see that the um, parazolopyrimidine compound 19 is no longer completely flat. So it's more 3D shape. So we've reduced the stacking. And we've also removed this intermolecular H bond. We have no nitrile and no uh, acidic hydrogen anymore, right? explaining the improved crystal packing. So now we have a scaffold that looks much more promising in terms of not only potency, but also the key property that was problematic, which was solubility. And compound 20 is a slightly improved analog of, of compound 19. So we put this compound in a PK in the rat, and you see that um, this improved solubility also translates into an improved oral bioavailability around 60% now, which is uh, perfectly acceptable. We have a reasonable clearance, a uh, reasonable half-life, about three hours. So that's for a lead compound, really uh, an attractive uh, set of PK properties. And we could even demonstrate for the first time uh, efficacy. This is a, a tumor model, a lymphoma model, where we inject uh, patient-derived tumor cells that have activating mutations. Uh, and we look at how fast the tumor grows. And this is on the right side. You see that in the black group, this is the vehicle group, the tumor grows very rapidly. While when we treat with the compound, we have a dose-dependent reduction of tumor growth uh, with no more tumor growth. So tumor st stasis with the high dose of 100 milligram per kilogram twice a day. So clearly, that's a fantastic starting point. It's a lead. It's not the drug candidate yet. But we thought that this scaffold was not perfect uh, to call this a lead. So before I conclude, uh, I wanted to come back to the question I asked at the very beginning. How do these compounds work? And actually, it took us a while to get a, a co-crystal structure between MALT1 and our compound. And what we found was that these compounds actually don't bind to the active site. So in here on the left, you have an overlay of MALT1 bound to a peptide. That's the uh, green structure where the peptide is on the up on the top uh, right of the, molecule, of the protein bound to the cysteine. Our compound is really uh, placed somewhere else in between uh, the two domains of the protein. Uh, and if you do a zoom, that's on the right, you see that it's binding very tightly in this uh, very lipophilic binding site. The only polar part of this binding site is uh, in the middle, the glutamate 397, which interacts with the, the urea. So now we understand why the urea uh, was important. And what's important for this uh, allosteric mode of action is because it's so specific to MALT1, these compounds are extremely selective. So they didn't show any activity against any of the proteases we've ever tested them against. Now, to understand this allosteric mechanism, we need to look at three different X-ray structures. And for all of these structures on the top, we have a zoom of the catalytic site. And at the bottom, we have a zoom of the allosteric site. So we start with the structure on the left, and you see that this is MALT1 in an active conformation, active because it can bind to a peptidic ligand. Now you zoom, you look at the bottom at the allosteric site, and you see a residue, uh, which is a tryptophan 580, which is placed outside of the two helices that are on, on the cartoon. 
in the middle, you have Maltuan APO, uh, so without ligand, and it's in an inactive conformation because the key substrate recognition elements are, are not placed correctly, so the enzyme cannot recognize the substrate. Look down again at the allosteric site, and you see that this tryptophan has moved in between the two helices. Okay. Now on the right, you have the co-crystal structure of MALT1 with our allosteric inhibitor. Again, on the top, we see that the catalytic site is in an inactive conformation. And what we see at the bottom is that the compound has taken the place of the tryptophan, kicked it out again, and is in between these two helices. So what we think is happening is that for MALT1 to get to an active conformation, the tryptophan needs to go out so that the domains can come together. If it's in between the two domains, the active site cannot reach the active conformation. And on the right, this is how our compounds, how we think the compounds work. They mimic the tryptophan and they lock the two domains in a conformation that prevents the active site to uh, become activated. So truly an allosteric uh, mechanism. So with this, I want to just summarize. Um, I think in this hit to lead story, what was essential is to have two steps of scaffold morphing. And this is not unusual. Uh, when you work on a difficult scaffold, you can do whatever you want to try to decorate and change the R groups. The only way to solve your challenges uh, will be to change the scaffold, right? So the first scaffold change was from the chromines to the quinolines to access a new exit vector to improve the potency. And then these compounds were potent, but had very low solubility and poor oral exposure. And that required a second step of scaffold morphing to the parazolopyrimidines, which now had decent potency, but also good solubility and high oral exposure. Now, as I mentioned, this was not um, the drugs. This was not the, the development candidates. If you want to know uh, the rest of the story, we've published two papers uh, that are referenced uh, at the bottom of this slide. So what remains for me to do is to thank the very large team of people at Novartis that um, contributed to this uh, story. And of course, again, I want to thank this uh, fantastic team of best practices in medicinal chemistry uh, who, who, who worked to produce this uh, open access material. And I thank you for your attention.